<laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak at today's session of the Expert Committee on Health to Discuss Assisted Dying. I am here today as chair of the Assisted Dying Coalition. And the overarching goal of my presentation today is to convince you that dying in a manner and at a time of your own choice is a fundamental human right. Because I know that many of you here today still take issue with that basic principle, so that's why I'm here today. To that end, I would like to give you an overview of the legal status of euthanasia around the world. Then I will go on to address some of the fears and concerns that still linger around assisted dying and hopefully show you that the benefits amply outweigh the risks. First, let's begin by going back to the notion of euthanasia. So in very basic terms, euthanasia comes from the Greek. That means good death. So essentially, the term refers to the practice of intentionally ending life in order to relieve pain and suffering. But of course, the term, the definition uh, varies from one country uh, to another and even from one state to another in uh, federal systems since the legal status of this practice also varies greatly from one place to the next. Now, what is known as passive euthanasia is legal in most countries under specific circumstances. So what I mean by passive euthanasia is often <laughs> referred to as pulling the plug. So this is when someone has reached the end of their life or they've been in a very serious accident and they're declared brain dead. This is what is known as passive euthanasia. But that's not going to be the focus of my speech since, as I said, it's legal in most places anyway. My focus is active euthanasia and what is known as assisted suicide. So here, euthanasia is deliberate, direct causation of death by a physician. Whereas, assisted suicide refers to the prescription of lethal medication that then is to be voluntarily, of course, self-administered by the patient. So even though, as you can see, these are two different practices, I believe that legalizing either guarantees the right that I'm here to defend, that is the right to choose the manner and timing of one's own death. And I think that that's what's most important. And again, that is what I'm here to discuss today. Euthanasia and assisted suicide are legal, or let's say de facto legal, in only a handful of countries around the world. And even within these countries, the practice is heavily uh, restricted to very, very specific circumstances. And in most cases, being able to enjoy this right generally requires the approval of several medical professionals, counsellors and other kinds of specialists. But we have come a long way and this is progress. 30 years ago, assisted dying was illegal everywhere in the world, except Switzerland. In 1995, Australia's Northern Territory introduced the world's first law that explicitly legalized assisted dying. And the law stated that adults that are terminally ill and mentally competent, which is another really important aspect that I'll get into later. So adults that are terminally ill and mentally competent who want to die, or wanted to die, could do so 
by asking a doctor for help. Again, under the right set of circumstances, they would be provided with legal drugs. But the law sparked outrage in Australia, and within a few months, the federal government had overturned it. Then, in 1997, uh, the American state of Oregon approved the so-called Death with Dignity Act. So the Death with Dignity Act initiated a sort of wave of liberalization when it came to uh, assisted dying. So in accordance with the Act in Oregon, two doctors must agree that a patient is of sound mind and has less than six months to live. So these are two criteria that have to be met before they can receive legal drugs. These drugs must be administered by the patient themselves, meaning that the Oregon Act allowed physician-assisted dying rather than euthanasia, which again would involve the drugs being injected directly by the doctor. So around 2,000 people have died peaceful deaths and were able to end their suffering thanks to this act. And not a single wrongful death was reported, or has been to this day. So this just goes to show that there's nothing overly dangerous or risky about legalizing physician-assisted dying. In fact, since then, assisted dying has become more widely available, as I was saying, around the world. And it is now legal in one form or another in about a dozen countries, and the trend seems set to continue, which is, again, a good thing. Today, five of Australia's six states have passed assisted dying laws. Belgium and the Netherlands legalized euthanasia in the early 2000s. Uh, Luxembourg followed suit in 2009. Uh, it's legal in Canada, in some U.S. states, including California, Colorado, Hawaii, New Jersey, Oregon, Washington State, Vermont, and District of Columbia. In 2021, both active euthanasia and assisted suicide were legalized in Spain. And very recent, I think it was a year or two ago, uh, New Zealand passed its end-of-life Choice Act. And in New Zealand, the End of Life Choice Act came after voters in New Zealand backed the idea in a referendum. 65% of uh, the population wanted this law to be passed. And I think that that's really important because it shows how widely accepted uh, passing such laws uh, is today in, in societies, or at least, I mean, Western societies. And I think that that's something that we could think about in other countries, you know, conducting referendums and having votes on the matter may be a sort of wake-up call for some governments who may think that, you know, no one, no one wants that and that no one would, would support it if it were put forward. Even in countries that could be considered conservative today, like Catholic majority countries such as Chile, Ireland, Italy, Uruguay, all of these countries are already moving towards enshrining the right to die in their legislation. Again, the exact circumstances in which assisted suicide is allowed vary. For instance, some jurisdictions only allow it in the case of terminal illness. In other countries, though, assisted dying has been extended and broadened and can include people with mental disorders or people with dementia. And in some cases, uh, it also extends to elderly people who just simply have had enough and are just tired of life. So as you can see, it's becoming increasingly accessible around the world. It's more and more available. And the trend is growing across the political and religious board. 
the number of people, therefore, that are dying in this way is also increasing, though, of course, it does represent a very small uh, share of everyone that dies. But as more countries liberalize, the total number will, of course, rise further. Now, this growing evidence from countries with assisted dying laws has assuaged fears that doing so will make it easy for families to sort of kill granny because it's too much work, you know, because of course it goes without saying that the practice should be carefully monitored, of course, this goes without saying it has to be highly regulated to avoid abuses. And some say that, you know, safeguards in place won't be enough, but Again, the growing evidence that we're seeing from the countries with such laws in place show us that this is really nothing to be worried about. Critics have long predicted that elderly relatives, so whose families are exhausted by the demands that, of caring for an elderly relative, these people might feel undue pressure to end their lives if the availability, if, if the possibility was there, to sort of relieve their families from the burden that they feel that they are. And another fear is that poor estates might encourage the most expensive patients to sort of hurry up and die. But again, I repeat, none, no evidence of this has been found in countries with laws in place. There are also fears that poorer people within richer countries might be hastened to end their lives because they're unable to afford treatment or, again, don't want to be a burden on their families. Well, in America, the Netherlands and Switzerland, the overwhelming majority of people who uh, choose uh, assisted death are actually highly educated and middle class. So it seems that, yes, of course, it's something to keep an eye on and it's something to bear in mind, but it's, again, not a major cause for concern. I think that it's fair to say that the abuses that assisted dying could entail remain largely hypothetical as opposed to the benefits of, uh, of passing such laws, which would be very real and actually really substantial for the people that would be affected. It relieves suffering. It restores a measure of dignity to people at the, ends of their li at the end of their life. Sorry. In places with the longest experiences, charities that represent the elderly or the disabled have not reported any abuse and of course it is conceivable that some abuse and has taken place unobserved but scrutiny has been intense thanks to the safeguards that are in place and in most countries the safeguards well if there's even a hint of coercion then permission to help someone to die is revoked immediately and I would say far from being too lax in most cases, one could argue that the rules have often been too restrictive and people haven't always had access to, to assisted dying even though it's legal. For instance, in some jurisdictions, doctors are not to mention it to patients that would qualify um, because they don't... because. They don't want the patients to to seem like they don't want the doctors to in any way have this coercive impact on the patients. It has to really come from them, which is a tragedy in itself. Because sometimes just knowing that the possibility is there can be uplifting and can be reassuring. To some patients, it gives them a sense of comfort, a sense of control over their lives. And what's really interesting is data from Oregon shows that a third of people 
who who are able to get to, to that obtain the prescribed lethal medication actually ultimately choose to not use it so this goes to show how just just knowing that you can sometimes can really make a huge difference I believe that Canada offers a, a really good model because it provides more leeway for individuals to make their own choices. So in Canada, anyone who's suffering, who's suffering is unbearable can choose assisted dying. Now, they do not have to be terminally ill. And uniquely, the question of what constitutes unbearable, unbearable is su unbearable suffering, is for the patients to decide themselves. And that they can take this decision as long as, again, they are of sound mind. Plus, of course, there are safeguards in place. There's a cooling off period of 90 days, especially for those patients whose death isn't reasonably foreseeable. So I think this means people that aren't terminally ill, that aren't expected to die within a month. In case they have second thoughts, this safeguard is in place. So I think that model is, is one that offers an interesting approach. Hard questions do remain, of course, especially when individuals' capacities uh, capacity to make an informed choice is in doubt. Now, here, this is well, people with dementia, uh, people with depression, uh, people with other types of mental illness who sometimes are able to make decisions for themselves. Sometimes that capacity can be called into question. Like, People with depression one day might feel like they want to die, but actually that's just like a phase, and the, you know, the, a week later they no longer want that. And so it's really important to make sure that doctors are able to ascertain what is uh, a sort of informed, consistent wish to put an end to your life, and what is a symptom of what you're going through. Now... If this isn't enough to convince you, let me just end by saying that, you know, I think it's important to put ourselves in their shoes uh, and maybe just to listen to some of the reasons cited by those who choose assisted dying. You know, these reasons are often existential rather than physical. It's more, again, they feel a loss of purpose. They feel that they will in, in time lose their dignity and they will just get to a place where they won't be able to enjoy life and they will lose their, their autonomy. And so if you know, we can prevent that from happening, I think that that's what this is really about. So on that note, Imagine just, you know, if you were there or if your mum was there, if that was your sister, your brother, your children were in that position, would you not like for them to be able to say goodbye on their own terms? Thank you.